بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين وصلى الله وسلم وبارك على نبينا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين رب شرح لي صدري ويسر لي أمري وأحل العقدة من لساني يفقه قولي اللهم علمنا ما ينفعنا وانفعنا بما علمتنا وزدنا علما Last week when we started this class on the seerah of the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam I mentioned that it's important before we actually start with the birth of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and his messengership, we need to go back a little bit in history and talk about the civilization in the Arabian Peninsula at that time. What type of a society was it that the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam came into? And last week we talked about the beginnings of Meccan civilization with Ibrahim alayhi salam and how he left his wife and his son in Mecca and how the civilization started from then and how it was a civilization of Tawheed where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala alone was worshipped in the Arabian Peninsula. And then we spoke about how Amr ibn Luhay brought shirk back into the Arabian Peninsula. How he brought the worship of idols into the Arabian Peninsula. And that lasted until the time of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam that the people of Mecca were worshippers of idols and the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said about this man that we spoke about last week Amr ibn Luhay the man who brought idolatry back into the Arabian Peninsula Amr ibn Luhay the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said about him Ra'aytu Amr ibn Luhay yajurru am'a'ahu fin nar I saw Amr ibn Luhay dragging his intestines in the fire. So this is the punishment of this man who brought shirk into the Arabian Peninsula. But if you look at the Quran, you see that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala addresses a number of different type of people who were present at that time. He addresses the mushrikeen who were the people of Quraysh. But if you look in some other ayat of the Quran, you see how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala also addresses the Jews and the Christians. So that means during the time of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam in the Arabian Peninsula, there were also Jews and there were also Christians. And we know from the history of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam in Medina, that there were Jews in Medina. And there were many incidences and incidents that happened between the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and the Jews of Medina. And we also know that the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam had interactions with Christians as well. A delegation of Christians from Najran, they came to Medina and they met the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and they had a discussion with him. So there were idol worshippers in the Arabian Peninsula and we spoke about how they came to be in the Arabian Peninsula by the, the works, the evil of Amr ibn Luhay, who brought idol, worshiper back, idol worshiping back into the Arabian Peninsula. Today we want to talk a little bit about how Christianity and Judaism came into the Arabian Peninsula. Because we need to understand these things so we can understand the Prophet Wasallam's interactions with all of these groups of people. How he interacted with the Kuffar, the Mushrikeen, the idol worshippers of the Quraysh, how he interacted with the Christians, how he interacted with the Jews. So we need to know a little bit about the history of all of these people and how they came to be in the Arabian Peninsula in the first place. And we know that during the time of the Prophet ﷺ, who were the rulers of Yemen? The rulers of Yemen were not Arabs, they were Persians. So during the time of the Prophet ﷺ, the Persians were ruling Yemen. And at that time, Yemen, it had Christians and Jews in Yemen as well. And Najran, as we mentioned, Najran is a city that is on the border of Yemen. It is in present-day Saudi Arabia, in the south part of present-day Saudi Arabia. Najran was a city that was completely Christian. So how did this come about? As for Medina, and it was only named Medina, al Madina al Nabawiyah, the Medina, the city of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. It was only called Medina after the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam came there and migrated there. Before it was called Medina, what was the name of this city? Does anybody know the name of the city? Yathrib, correct. The name of the city was Yathrib. And there were Jews in Yathrib as well. Also in Khaybar, which is a city about 150 kilometers north of Medina, there were Jews there as well. And the way that the Jews came to Yathrib and to Khaybar, they came from Sham. 
they came from the greater Syria area. There were Jews up there and they migrated southwards. They came to Medina and they came to uh, uh, Khaybar and they settled over there. So this is how the Jews came into these cities. Now, what was the origin of how these religions came into Yemen and how they came into the Arabian Peninsula? As we mentioned, Yemen is the root country of the Arabs. The original Arabs, they came from Yemen. And only after the water supply of Yemen was depleted, that's when they started moving around in the Arabian Peninsula to different parts and inhabiting different parts of that land. So most of the historians, they start speaking about the history of how Judaism and Christianity entered into the Arabian Peninsula by starting with the history of one of the rulers of Yemen. And his name was Rabi'ah ibn Nasr. He was a ruler of Yemen and his name was Rabi'ah ibn Nasr. And as we know, after Amr ibn Luhay, idol worshipping became very common throughout the Arabian Peninsula and that actually penetrated Yemen as well. So the people of Yemen, they were idol worshippers, they used to commit shirk, they used to consult magicians and soothsayers and fortune tellers and this type of a thing. So Rabi'ah ibn Nasr, he was the king of Yemen at that time. And he had a dream. He had a dream. And he went to some of the soothsayers and fortune tellers for the interpretation of that dream. And he was told that the interpretation of that dream is that in some point in the future that the Ahbash, the Habashis, and these are the people who uh, inhabit current day what is called Ethiopia. The Ahbash will rule Yemen. Now Rabi'a ibn Nasr, he's the king of Yemen. And he is being told that the interpretation of his dream is that the Ahbash, the Ethiopians are going to come and take over Yemen. So he became worried about this. He became scared about this. And he feared for his family. And when he asked them, when is this going to happen? Around when do you think this is going to happen? They told him maybe 60 to 70 years. Maybe in 60 to 70 years, the rulers of Yemen are going to be Habashis. And he became scared about this for his family. Because he thought, okay, when they come and they take over, you know, there's probably going to be a lot of bloodshed, a lot of killing and this type of thing. So I need to keep my family safe. So what he did is he sent his family to a place called Hira in, in modern day Iraq. He sent his family to Iraq, but he stayed in Yemen because he was the king. He had to stay in Yemen and he kept one of his sons with him as well because his intention was that when he died, then his son is going to take over the kingdom as well. And when his son became the ruler of Yemen, he kept a son with him as well to take over after he died. And this continued for some time. And the ruler of Yemen, the title for the ruler of Yemen was called the Tubba. Tubba. Just like the title for any of the rulers of Rome, they were called Qaisar. The title of any of the rulers of Persia, they were called Kisra. The title of the rulers of uh, Ethiopia, they were called Najashi. Right? This was a title, an honorary title for the rulers of these lands. Just like in the past, the rulers of Egypt, the rulers of Egypt, what were they known as? They were known as what? Fir'aun, yes. The rulers of Egypt were Fir'aun. So the ruler of Yemen, he was known as Tubba. And this continued for some time. The sons of Rabi'a ibn Nasr, the sons and the grandsons, they kept this kingdom alive and they were continuing in their roles as the leaders of Yemen until a time came where one of the sons, one of the grandsons of Rabi'a ibn Nasr, his name was Tabban As'ad. Tabban As'ad. He was the Tubba. He was the ruler of Yemen. And he was a very generous man. He was a very powerful man. He was a very rich man. And he was very business oriented as well. He was business savvy. He was the king of Yemen, but he also continued to do his business and his trade. So one day he was going on a business expedition from Yemen to Sham, all the way from the south of the Arabian Peninsula, Yemen. He was going all the way north up to Sham, greater Syria. So he was going there for some business prospect. 
and he took his son with him. Taban ibn Asad took his son with him on that journey. On the way from Yemen to Syria, they passed through Yathrib. They passed through Yathrib, which later on came to be known as Medina, but at that time it was Yathrib. And he saw an opportunity there in Yathrib to do some business as well. But he had to go to Syria, he had to go to Sham to do his business. So what he decided to do is he left his son in Yathrib. He said, okay, you stay here in Yathrib, you take care of the business. I'm going to go up to Sham and take care of the business there. So he went to Sham and he left his son in Yathrib. Now, his son in Yathrib and the people of the city, the people of Yathrib, they had some fights and some arguments and it got very escalated and eventually the son of Tabban ibn Asad, he was killed by the people of Yathrib. He was murdered, he was killed by the people of Yathrib. Now, when his father heard about this, when the news reached him, he left Sham and he came back to Yathrib. And he ordered an army to come from Yemen as well, to come to Yathrib and to fight the people of Yathrib to take revenge for his son. So he decided to take revenge for his son and he wanted to kill the people of Yathrib and he wanted to destroy the city. So he called the army from Yemen and they were fighting with the people of Yathrib and the war began. And this war, it lasted for some time. And while this war was going on, the Tubba, whose name was Tabban ibn Asad, as we mentioned, he was amazed at some of the characteristics of the people of Medina, even at that time. Even at that time, he was amazed by some of the characteristics and the personality traits of the people of Yathrib. What did they used to do? What was he amazed with? They used to fight in the daytime. They used to fight in the day, but then when nightfall came, both sides would retreat to their camps. And then they would continue fighting when the sun came up again. Because you can't fight in the dark. It's not like how it is today where you have all sorts of lights and you know, electricity and this type of thing. No, when it's dark, it's dark. So they didn't use to fight in the night. Both sides had an agreement, of course, that when nightfall comes, both camps or both parties have to retreat to their camps. So they would fight during the day and when the sun set, they would both retreat to their camps. Now, Tabban ibn Asad and his army, they were in their camp. And during the nights, the people of Yathrib, they would send them food and drink and they would send them, you know, all sorts of provisions. And in the daytime, they would be fighting with them. But in the night, they would show their generosity by sending them food and drink and whatever they needed. So Tabban ibn Asad, he was, he was amazed at this. He was like, who, who honors their enemies in such a way? We are fighting these people, we are killing these people, and they are killing us. But at the same time, when we're not fighting during the night, they're sending us food and drink, and they're honoring us, and they're showing us such generosity. He was absolutely amazed at this. He was like, this is something that is unbelievable. I've never seen anything like this before. And if you think about it, it really is amazing. It really is something that is amazing. But still, out of his anger at these people for the fact that they killed his son, he still wanted to continue to fight them. And he continued to fight them. Now, as we mentioned, Yathrib, it had some Jews there. Because some of the Jews from Sham, from, up, from greater Syria, they had migrated to Yathrib. So there were some Jews there too. So two of the scholars of these Jews, while this fighting was going on, two of the scholars of the Jews who were settled in Yathrib, who had migrated from Sham, they went to Tabban ibn Asad and they said, we need to sit down and we need to talk to you about what's going on. So he said, okay, let's talk, let's have a discussion. These two scholars of the Jews, they asked Tabban, they asked the Tubba, what do you want? What is your goal in this fighting? What do you want to do? What is your objective? And the Tubba said, I want to kill these people, I want to destroy this city. They killed my son. I will not rest until the city of Yathrib is in ruins. It has to be destroyed completely. I will take revenge for my son. Now these two scholars of the Jews, they said to him, Wallahi, you will never be able to do it to this city. Wallahi, you will never be able to destroy the city. No matter how many people you bring, no matter how many weapons you bring, no matter what type of destruction you think you can wreak here, you will never be able to destroy the city. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will destroy you before you are able to destroy this city. 
this city in particular. And then he was amazed at this speech. He said, why do you say this? What is special about this place? And they said to him, this is a place, this is a city where a prophet is going to come and migrate to this city. A prophet that's going to come in the future, he's going to come and he's going to settle in this city. So there's no way that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is going to allow you to destroy this city. And then he said to him, what are you talking about? What are you talking about? What prophet is going to come and come to the city? How do you know this? Where are you getting this information? Then they said, we get this information from our book, the Torah. And this was the book that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala revealed to Musa alayhi salam. And it had a lot of information about the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. It really did. It had information about the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam in the Torah. And the true Jews, the people who really believed in the Torah, they knew that a Prophet was going to come. So they told the Tubba, they said, this is the city, a Prophet is going to come and migrate to the city. And we get the information that we are telling you from our book, the Torah. So he became amazed at this. He had never heard about this type of thing before. So he got interested in it and he asked them, what is this book, the Torah? What does it teach you? And he started to study it with them and they started to teach him about Tawheed, the oneness of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and they taught him the message of Musa alayhi salam. They taught him the Torah and he was very impressed with it. He was very impressed with it. And at the end of the conversation and these teachings, he became a Jew. Tabban ibn Asad, he accepted Judaism and he became a Jew. And he left the fighting in Medina, he abandoned it. Then he left the city and he was on his way and he was in the Hijaz. The Hijaz is the area of uh, present day Saudi Arabia where Medina is included in that, Mecca is included in that. It's a general region that is in the Arabian Peninsula. So there was a tribe in the Hijaz that occupied the Hijaz and this tribe was called Hudayl the tribe of Hudayl, and they hated the people of Mecca. The tribe of Hudayl, they hated the people of Mecca, and they also hated the people of Yemen. They hated the people of Mecca, and they hated the people of Yemen. And when they saw that the Tubba is in town, the Tubba is around here, the leader of Yemen is here, they saw this as an opportunity to eliminate both of their enemies, to eliminate the Yemenis, and to eliminate the people of Mecca by pitting them against each other. So what did the people of Hudayl, what did they say to the Tubba when they met him? They said, before you leave this place, do you want treasures and gold and jewels? And he said, of course. I mean, if, if it's available, you know, if there's treasures and gold and jewels that I can take, of course I want it. So they said to him, there is a place in Mecca, there is a house in Mecca, and in that house and around that house, there is jewel, jewels and gold and treasures buried there. And what is this house that he's talking about? He's talking about the Kaaba. The Kaaba. And it's true that the Arabs, out of their respect and their honor for the Kaaba, they used to actually bury gold and jewels and other treasure items around the Kaaba. So it was full of treasures all around, buried there. So these people of Hudayl, they told the Tubba, there is this house. And remember, the Tubba is someone who just accepted Judaism. He doesn't really know anything about the religion. He doesn't know what the Kaaba is or anything about it. All he knows is what these people told him. There is this house in the city of Mecca. And around it, there is a lot of valuable stuff buried there. So you can go ahead and, and get it. So he became, you know, he, he, he decided, yeah, I want to do that. I want to go and get it. So he started preparing his army and getting them ready to go to Mecca and overtake the people of Mecca so they could extract these treasures from around the Kaaba. Now these two scholars of the Jews, the people who originally gave him da'wah to become a Jew, they were around, he kept them around. And when they saw him getting ready and they saw him getting his army ready, they asked him, what are you doing? Who are you getting ready to fight? We see you preparing your army. And then he told them, he said, I was told by this tribe of Hudayl that there is a house in the city of Mecca and around that house there is buried a lot of valuable treasure items, gold, jewels and other things. And I want to go there with my army and I want to extract this treasure. So these two scholars of the Jews, they said, Wallahi, these people of Hudayl, they don't want good for you. They only want your destruction. They want you to be destroyed. Because 
if you go and try to do anything to the house, that house that they're talking about, then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will destroy you. And then he said, why? What is it? He said, that is the only house of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that we know on this earth at this time. That is the house of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You try to do anything to that house and the destruction of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will come to you. So don't listen to these people. They're trying to trick you. They want you to be destroyed. They want you to go ahead and destroy the people of Mecca. And then they want Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to destroy you for trying to uh, violate the sanctity of his house. So don't do it. So he was surprised. He said, okay. He was very, very attentive to these two scholars. He listened to whatever they had to say. So he said, okay, I'm not going to do it. So what should I do? What should I do? Now we're around Mecca. We're already in the area. What should I do now that we're here? They said you should respect the house of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Rather than trying to extract those treasures that are buried around there, you respect the house of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Go to the house of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and make tawaf. Go to the house of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and make tawaf. And then he said, okay. But he noticed that when he went there to do tawaf, those two scholars, they were not making tawaf. And then he asked, what about you? I'm going to do as you told me to do. Respect the house of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and make tawaf around this house. But what about you? Why, why don't you do it? And they said to him, we are scholars. We are people of knowledge. And at this time, the people of Mecca have filled this house with idols. It is filled with idols, objects of worship besides Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So it is not appropriate for us, you know, as people of knowledge, as people of scholars, to make tawaf around the Kaaba while it's in this situation when idols are in it. But as for the common people like you, you can do it. But for us, we can't do it at this time until it is cleansed from the idols. So he understood that, he said okay, and he went to Mecca and he made tawaf of the house of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and he showed his respect to the house of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And he stayed in Mecca for the night and he slept. And when he slept, when the tubba of Yemen, Tabban As'ad, when he slept in Mecca, he had a dream. He had a dream that he was covering the Kaaba with a cloth. He was putting a cloth cover around the house of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, which is called the kiswa, the cover of the Kaaba. He had this dream. So when he had this dream, he ordered for a cloth to be sent from Yemen, from the very luxurious and beautiful cloth of Yemen to come so that he can put this kiswa around the house of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the kiswatul Kaaba. Before that time, the Kaaba was a bare structure. It didn't have any cover around it. And Tabban ibn As'ad, the Tubba of Yemen, he was the first person in history to put a cover, to put a kiswa around the Kaaba. And it continued every year. Every year they would put a new kiswa on the Kaaba. But they would not remove the old one. They would put a new one over the old one. Every year they would put a new covering over the Kaaba but they would not remove the old one. Rather, the new covering would just cover the old covering. And this went on for many years. This went on for many years. Every year, they're putting a kiswa on the Kaaba, and the next year, it's doubled, and the next year, another layer, the next year, another layer, the next year, another layer, and this kept going on and on and on and on for years. And it lasted actually up to the time of the Quraysh, up to the time of Quraysh, up to the time of the grandfather of the Prophet wasallam, Abdul Muttalib. And at that time, they noticed that there are so many layers of the kiswa on this Kaaba, so many layers of cloth covering it over the years, that they were afraid that the Kaaba would collapse, that the structure of the Kaaba would not be able to support this heaviness. So they decided, the Quraysh, in the time of Abdul Muttalib, they decided to remove all of those old covers and put a new cover on it, and every subsequent year, they would put a new cover, but they would remove the old cover. So every year, remove the old cover and put a new cover. Remove the old cover and put a new cover every year. And that tradition continues up to our present time today. Every year, they remove the old kiswa of the Kaaba and they put a new kiswa of the Kaaba over. This has been going on for, since the time of Abdul Muttalib, a new kiswa every year. And if you go back to the time even before that of Tabban ibn Asad, he is the one who actually started the concept of putting a cover around the Kaaba. 
So that is the history of the Kiswa of the Kaaba. We actually have a piece of that Kiswa, the old, one of the old Kiswas in the library of this masjid. If you go and you see, uh, you know, you see on the bookshelf right when you enter the library on your left side, you will see a framed piece of one of the previous years Kiswa of the Kaaba. So they continue this tradition every year, putting a new covering over the Kaaba. So this is what the Tubba of Yemen, Tabban As'ad, did in Mecca. Then, after he was completed with this, he returned back to Yemen. He went back to his country. He went back to Yemen. And he brought these two scholars of the Jews with him to Yemen as well. They were accompanying him now wherever he goes. Because he wanted them to be with him. He had accepted Judaism. He had become a Jew. And he wanted these two scholars with him to invite the people to Judaism as well. So he got them back with him to Yemen. Because he said, I want you guys to come to Yemen. And I want to invite my people to accept the Torah and to become Jews as well. So I need your help. You come with me. So they came with him. They went back to Yemen. And Yemen was a place that was full of shirk. And they used to consult soothsayers and fortune tellers and you know these type of evil liars about their affairs. So when the Tubba came back to Yemen, he called on his people to accept Judaism. And they said, we will not take this type of a decision until we consult our fire. They used to have a fire. You know, they used to worship many objects, stones and idols and this type of thing. And one of the things that they used to hold holy was a fire that they had. And this fire, it was encased in a structure that had a door. So there was a fire and it was covered around in a structure and there was a door to this structure. So whenever two people would have some kind of an argument or some type of a disagreement with each other, they would go to that fire to decide who is right and who is wrong. So what they would do, the two people, they would go to the fire and they would open the door. And whoever the fire came to first, you know how a fire is, you know, if you open a door to it, it will come out. So they would go to the front of that fire. Someone would stand on one side and another person would stand on the other side and they would open the door to that structure and the fire would come out. So whoever the fire hit first, whichever side it came to first, that person was considered the wrongdoer and the other person was considered victorious. That is how they used to decide their affairs. So when the Tubba came back to Yemen to invite his people to Judaism, they said, we will not make any decision in this affair until we go to the fire. And we will see if what you're telling us is correct or not. So the Tubba, he looked at his two companions, the two scholars of the Jews. He looked at them. Like, what do you think about this? They said, okay, let them do it. Let them go ahead and do that. So they gathered their fortune tellers and soothsayers and on the other side, these two scholars of the Jews. So the two scholars of the Jews were standing on one side of the door and the fortune tellers and the soothsayers were standing on the other side of the door. And they opened the door and the fire hit the soothsayers and the fortune tellers and they started to run away. And then the people said, wait, wait, you can't run away. We are using this fire to decide between the truth and the falsehood. You can't just run away like that. Come back. So they came back again. And they said, okay, we're going to try it again. And this time you can't run. They said, okay. They opened the, fire, they opened the door again. The fire came out again. It went to the soothsayers and the fortune tellers. And it hit them with such severity that they were burned alive. They were burned alive. And the two scholars of the Jews, they were untouched. When the people witnessed this, all of them accepted Judaism and that is how Judaism entered into Yemen so this is some of the background history of how Judaism came into the Arabian Peninsula and how it came into Yemen in particular and going back to the dream that Rabi'ah ibn Nasr had that eventually the Ahbash the Habashis they will come and they will rule Yemen if you look at the year of the birth of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, the year that the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam was born, it is known as Amul Fil, the year of the elephant. And it is known as the year of the elephant because that is the year that Abraha came from Yemen to destroy the Kaaba. He was the ruler of Yemen. Abraha was the ruler of Yemen and he came to destroy the Kaaba. Abraha was the ruler of Yemen, but where was he from? Abraha was a Habashi. Abraha was an Ethiopian. But he became the ruler of Yemen over time. And this happened 
this incident where Abraha came from Yemen to destroy the Kaaba, it happened in the year that the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wasallam was born. And inshallah, we will continue to talk about that in our next lesson, bi ithnillah. Wallahu alam wa sallallahu wa sallam wa baraka ala nabiyyina Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajma'in.